about a decade ago, I became a newly minted father. And at about the same time, I also became a newly minted professor in computer science. And I remember, as a newly minted father slash professor, holding my son in my arms and telling him, Bertrand, I am going to be the most loving and accepting and understanding father in the world. Because honestly, I mean, if I'm being truthful, I'll support you in whatever you do, and I don't think I even really care in which end field of engineering you get your PhD. <laughs> as long as you're happy. <laughs> so what I could not have known in that moment was that Bertrand would not go on to get a, a PhD in engineering, and yet many would soon go on to get their PhD in Bertrand. And that's because a short time later, I got a call from my wife. And she was at the hospital, and she told me that our son was dying. And I remember feeling shock, and then denial, and then rage. And in that rage, I made a vow. I said, we will hunt down this killer. And the crazy thing is, we actually did it. It took us three years. My wife crisscrossed the country in pursuit nonstop, but we actually did it. The twist here, as it turns out, is that we, his parents, were found responsible for his death. Because Bertrand, at four years old, became the first patient ever discovered of an ultra-rare genetic disorder. It's called NGLY1, or NGLY1 deficiency. And this left him with seizures, a movement disorder, severe developmental delay, and for some reason, an inability to cry tears. I mean, he could cry, but he would not make liquid tears. So this pushed us onto an odyssey into uh, you know, ultimately what became called precision medicine. And so what I want to do now is tell you a, a story about Bertrand, but really a much bigger story about precision medicine. And in, in telling you Bertrand's story, uh, I, I think we come to understand what is we're doing in this brand new field. So Bertrand's story really begins back at about six months old when his pediatrician told us that something was wrong. She said, it looks like he has brain damage. And we thought, oh God, it's terrible. So we got an MRI, and the MRI was clear. Well, he looked okay. And then she said, well, I think maybe he's got this other terrible disease. It's ataxia telegictasia. It's a horrible, degenerative, always fatal condition. So we did a gene test, and it wasn't that it either. And so we thought, what is this? Uh, and really, this began this horrible cycle a tentative, terrifying diagnosis, a test, and then, nope, that's not it. And this cycle continued for a long time. But then, by about 15 months, something terrible happened. We got really bad news. So at about 15 months, some lab results came back that didn't give us a diagnosis, but they told us that whatever this was, it was going to be fatal. And I remember, you know, my, my wife maintained this amazing blog at the time to communicate to friends and family, and I, and I put a post up that night uh, to just convey the results. It went something like this. You know, we don't know how long he has, but some searching indicates he may live to just three years or just beyond. We're holding out hope, uh, holding on to what little hope is left, but it seems that the window for miracles is about to close. Now, of course, we will do everything possible for him, and if that fails, we'll try the impossible. Now, soon enough, we had tried everything possible. We tried every conceivable diagnosis for Bertrand, and none of them stuck. So all we were left with was the impossible. So the question is, how do you do the impossible? Well, if you need to do the impossible, you have to do science. So what exactly is science? Well, I think, because uh, science in some sense is the, the systematic transformation of the unknown into the known, and by extension then, the transformation of the impossible into the possible. So again, how do you do, how do, you do that? Well, uh, this is not a talk on the philosophy of science, so I need to substitute for now a ruthlessly pragmatic definition of what science really is. So for the moment, we're going to say that science is whatever those folks with PhDs do. <laughs> so now, we just need to know, well, what's a PhD? So as it turns out, you know, when I used to give the orientation lecture to new PhD students, I, I have to explain this to, to them every year. So, and I actually had a really hard time doing this with words, so I ended up coming up with what I call the illustrated guide to a PhD. And I'll share that with you now to illustrate both science and PhD simultaneously. So it goes something like this. You start with a circle that contains all of human knowledge. Now when you're little, in grade school, you learn a little. 
when you're in high school, you learn a little bit more. When you go to college, you finally gain a specialty. If you get a master's degree, you will deepen that specialty. And if you enroll in a PhD program, you're going to spend the first few years reading papers to take you all the way out to the edge of human knowledge. Once you get there, you focus and you push. You push that boundary for a few years until one day that boundary gives way. And that little dent you've made is called a PhD. <laughs> so. So. I can tell you from experience uh, as a student and as an advisor that when you finally get to that moment, your world looks very different to you at that point. All you can see is that little dent. It's just that little red bump at the edge. So you have to remember that you know, science is the work of many hands and many minds over time, all pushing out of the boundaries and slowly expanding the circle into the unknown and the undiscovered. Um, and the reason this is important now is that, well, we had to do this for Bertrand. We needed to make a discovery for Bertrand because we tried all the known diseases. So whatever this was was clearly unknown. We had to discover to diagnose. So how exactly do you do that? Well, we suspected it was a genetic disorder, and this meant that we could peer into Bertrand's DNA for the answer. And around the, luckily, around this time, there, were new, there was new technology coming out that actually allowed you to do this. So just for the sake of simplifying things, let's just assume that your, your DNA is a book. It's really an instruction manual on how to build and operate you, and it's got about six billion letters in it. And uh, what we were looking for in this book was effectively a typo. You can think of it as a mutation. And we thought that this was probably the leaning cause, or the, the root cause of Bertrand's disease. So these typos can actually have dramatic impact on the meaning of this book. So if you change one letter in the sentence, it, it really does change the meaning from my dad is rad to my dad is mad. Well, if you do this in, a, in DNA, if you do this to a genome, you can give somebody a genetic disorder. And we thought this is what happened to Bertrand. So we partnered with scientists. We looked into Bertrand's genetic book. And sure enough, there were two typos in it. There were typos in a gene called NGLY1. This destroyed the function of this gene. And then came the shocking news that if this really was the cause, and they believed it was, Bertrand was the only patient in the world known for this disorder. So he was all alone. Patient zero, an N of one. You know, he had no community, so no prognosis, and of course, no treatment. And then the dreaded words. Uh, in, in medical jargon, they call this not actionable. There's nothing you can do. So, I don't know, I just fundamentally disagreed with that notion that there's nothing you can do. I mean, there's always got to be something you can do. And in this case, living inside that new, that new dent, we could peer beyond the boundary of human knowledge and we could see a little bubble. There's a little bubble out there that contained the knowledge we needed to save Bertrand's life. And now we could actually kind of see the contrast. We could see where it was. And so, the question was, how do you get there? And really what you need to do then is continue to make a series of dents in that boundary until you get all the way to the knowledge you need. So that became the game plan. Get to that bubble. Now, of course, that's easier said than done. And it's really, really difficult to do that alone. But when I asked the scientists how long was it going to take to find a second patient, they said, with a disease this rare, you could take 10 to 20 years before you ever see another patient with this disease. I said, well, we can't do one family versus an entire disease. That doesn't scale. And what they didn't realize is, as a computer scientist, I had access to a secret weapon. And that weapon was Google. <laughs> so obviously, you can't just Google for more patients for a disease that didn't exist yesterday. That doesn't work. But you can do something else. You can bring other patients to you. And that's what we did. So to do that, I wrote a blog post that was designed to do two things. It had to rank very highly in Google search results and also go viral. The amazing thing is it actually did. So then what happened is people would type in things like lack of, te lack of tears and seizures. They would find this page and they would find us. And so very shortly, within a year, we had a small patient community of about 10 patients. Today, seven years later, we're closing on 70 for one of the rarest diseases in the world. So then we can say, well, what can you do with this community that we could not have done when it was just Bertrand? Well, you can do science. So the small community marched off to NIH. And we took part in a, in a research study to 
deeply understand what was going on inside of this disease. Uh, and again, almost every single living patient marched into this protocol. And through the understanding and the science that emerged from this investigation, we started to get some insight into what was really going on with this, this, this disease. And in fact, I was able to make some calculations and some derivations. I realized that Bertrand was probably missing something as a consequence of his missing gene. In fact, what he's missing is this right here. It's N-acetylglucosamine. And I'm not a chemist either, so that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, but again, secret weapon, Google. Yeah. I Googled it. And about three days onto this powder, I went into his room, I heard him crying, and I looked over into his bed, and what I saw was, for the first time in his life, uh, a tear. So he was crying tears. And uh, he's cried many more since. And uh, you know, I, I, was, I was just shocked. I didn't know what to expect, but that's what happened. And it, the important thing to remember here is this is a child who used to have eye surgeries to drain the pus from his infected eyes from the lack of tears, who was told that we would likely have to sew his eyes shut to protect his remaining vision, and here he was making tears. So I did what any parent does the first time they see their child cry. You know, I collected his tears. I packed them on dry ice, <laughs> and I shipped them to a lab in California for analysis. So um, those small tears, they swelled into an ocean of science for the disorder as a whole. I mean, it brought us a lot of understanding about this disease. And it prompted us to say, hey, can we do better? You know, can we go beyond just making Bertrand cry? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, it turns out we can. So at around this time, there was a researcher in Japan, and, and he was working on the, the, the fundamental biology of this gene, and he realized something. He realized that if you disabled a second gene called N-gaze in conjunction with NGLI1, you started to correct this disease at a cellular level. It's like, okay, that's interesting. And so a few experiments later, we realized, okay, this also, you know, it seems to work in worms, and it also seems to work in mice. So can we actually find a drug that will disable the second gene and do for the mice and worms, or do for Bertrand what it's done for the mice and worms? Well, let's give it a shot. So again, to egregiously oversummarize, the answer is yes, there is such a drug. So we did a lot of work with computational simulations, a lot of worms, a lot of mice, kind of a mess, um, bench science, uh, and we found a drug that does this. And that drug is Prevacid. So Prevacid had a hidden side effect. It's an N-gaze inhibitor. No one knew this but it turns out to be exactly what Bertrand needed. He doesn't actually have acid reflux, but he takes Prevacid anyway. And so, you know, it, 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 Bertrand's come a long way, you know, in, in, in a short amount of time. So if you think back to, you know, that original dent in the boundary, we've made a few more dents, and we are getting really tantalizingly close to knowledge that could really cure Bertrand and save his life. Uh, but ultimately, he's, he's significantly better today than he was when he was born, you know, from hundreds of seizures a day then to none now to being at risk of losing his vision to seeing perfectly. But ultimately, I think, you know, by, by the most important metric in life, Bertrand is doing very well. And that, that's because the most important metric in life is the one that you measure in smiles per hour. And by that metric, we're doing incredibly well because Bertrand is actually happy all day, every day. <laughs> and of course, we will continue the search. We will continue making those dents until we get all the way out there. Now, in the course of this, you know, Bertrand ended up being an accidental pioneer in this process of precision medicine. So precision medicine is really all about harnessing all of the available data on a patient, oftentimes their genome, to find and identify the root cause of the disease for them. So we can attack the disease at that root cause and identify the best possible treatment. That's what we're trying to do within precision medicine. And precision medicine today is by and large about scaling this process up so that even if Bertrand himself is incredibly rare, Stories like his won't be. And I guess there's a broader message in all of this, and that's about not actionable, and what you do when you're told that something or some condition or some diagnosis is not actionable, because I just don't fundamentally believe that. Because it's always been the case, and it always will be the case, that in the event that there is nothing you can do, you can do science. Thank you.